what should kids learn in school? It's a simple question, but it's one that has confounded experts for decades. Billions of dollars have been spent to study, legislate, inform, and distribute what it is exactly we should be teaching in school. But I figure with a captive audience at TEDx Chattanooga, I'll save a lot of time and money and just ask you. You just received some sticky notes and a pen, and I'd like to ask you to write one idea per note. You're going to have to do this fast. We're on a tight time limit. One idea per note as you respond to this question, and feel free to write on multiple stickies if you need them. What content, skills, and habits should every student master in school? So go ahead and begin writing. Again, keep it quick. And when you finish writing, if you'll, I know this is odd, but stand up and put your stickies on the wall. Some folks over here will help you get to the wall. I know it's tight. Stick them under the appropriate categories. And don't worry if you can't figure out if time management is like a habit or a skill. It's up to you. There's no quiz at the end today, I promise. So one more time, what content, skills, and habits should all students learn in school? It's helpful when your CEO comes and gets the audience moving quickly. Thank you. So we'll give you about 30 more seconds, and then if you can start migrating over here. What are those things you're looking for when you go to hire a new employee? What, how do they think? How do they engage with the world around them? What do they know? What skills do they bring to the table? What habits have they cultivated over time? What makes them a valuable asset to your organization? On the content, while I see things like history, I think I see reading. Chris, can you write off one or two more that you see there? Financial literacy. Financial literacy. Accounting. Account definitely important content. On the skills and habit wall, I see things like problem solving and critical thinking. I see coding that resonates personally. Logical thinking. Empathy. Time management. I see project management. Great. We'll give you just a few more minutes or a few more moments here to get those on the wall. Thank you. As they wrap up putting their thoughts on the wall, I think it's pretty clear that while we all agree that content is important, we also clearly agree that these habits and skills, our, our team, we've grown to call these process skills collectively, that these things also really matter. We went out and asked leaders from business, industry, and higher education essentially the same question. And as educators, we sort of expected they would respond with things that were reminiscent of those activities we typically really value in school. We thought we would hear things like, well, students need to be great at factoring trinomials or analyzing Renaissance literature or climbing a rope in front of your friends <laughs> in, un in uncomfortable shorts. We maybe didn't expect that one. But what we got was almost exclusively habits and skills, process skills. As we analyzed these results a little bit further, we began to realize that two primary categories were emerging from these responses. Leaders are clamoring for students who have strong interpersonal skills, like collaboration and communication. They're also actively looking for students who have strong, what we call, learning skills. Skills like critical thinking, adaptability, and creativity. Unfortunately, we've relied on the, the ease to quantify and assess content that we've spent the last few decades watching the education pendulum get stuck on the wall of content. And, and certainly, content matters, clearly. I want my students learning math and science, art, history, reading. But what's clear is when we talk to leaders, these process skills are at least as important as content mastery. Well, this realization pushed our team to begin designing learning experiences that would empower students to start to cultivate these process skills. But to explain this, I need to take you back in time just a little bit. In 2005, a tall, lanky kid from southeast Tennessee had a dream of becoming the next great college basketball coach. He accepted a role teaching at a local high school, teaching math, and eventually worked his way into a head coaching position. 
As time went on, he worked his way up academically as well and started teaching AP Calculus and Computer Science. But despite this vertical trajectory in his career, in 2014, all the momentum came to a screeching halt. A new principal was assigned to the school, and I was fired. Devastated and a little confused, I began looking for what would be my next option. This is when I, I met a, a new principal at the, the local STEM school here in Chattanooga. He approached me and asked if I'd consider applying for a brand new position at his school to be a fab lab teacher. Well, I was honored to be recruited, but I was pretty hesitant because, well, frankly, I had no idea what a fab lab was. I did some homework, eventually applied. I toured the school and talked with students, met with faculty, and then I sat down with Dr. Donan. After peppering him with what seemed like endless questions, I eventually realized that a fab lab is essentially a computerized workshop where if you can dream it, you can probably build it. Well, I also realized I needed to be honest with the principal. In my last interview, I explained that I was probably not a great fit for this role. I shared that I didn't own any power tools and I paid people to change my oil. <laughs> <laughs> to say I wasn't mechanically inclined was a gross understatement. <laughs> to my delight though, Dr. Donan explained that he didn't care about my lack of experience in a workshop or my sort of low levels of mechanical proficiency. He cared about my mindset. He cared that I was willing to learn in front of and alongside students. Well, speaking of learning, that was more in my lane. I, I went ahead and asked, in this lab, what exactly are students supposed to learn? His response surprised me. He simply said, critical thinking, collaboration, and creative problem solving. I ended up accepting the role and over the next four months started to try to set this lab up and learn as much as I could as quickly as possible. Just before school started the next year and students would arrive and you know, we would actually like start doing stuff, I once again found myself in the principal seat. It's not always the most comfortable chair in the building. This time I was updating Dr. Donan on the progress we had made to set up the lab and let him know the 3D printers had just arrived and I was excited to set them up. I had never actually seen them before in real life. I had just watched lots of like videos on YouTube about them. So I was eager to get my hands dirty. Surprisingly, he told me no. He refused to let me open the printers until the students arrived. Now, can you imagine? 90 teenagers show up in your class in just a few days and you can't touch the technology that you've never seen before? It was a little daunting and though I was new, I pushed back a bit. His response changed my paradigm forever. He said, remember, the goal isn't to teach content like 3D printing. The goal is to empower students to leverage access to resources to be able to solve complex problems as they develop process skills and content mastery. He went on to explain that you can't do this as a teacher if you're already the expert on everything. So the students need to see you learn. They need to learn with you, not from you. He explained they need someone to model these process skills. They need to see a teacher demonstrate what it looks like to engage in critical thinking, in innovation, and in creative problem solving. In other words, this is how dense I was. It took me 10 years in the classroom, two degrees in education, and multiple conversations with a visionary school principal to discover what all of you wrote on the wall intuitively just a few moments ago. That developing these habits and skills may be the single most empowering experience we can provide for students during their academic journey. But the question becomes, if all of us know that intuitively, why do we still do school the way we do it? Why do we still overvalue content acquisition as measured through relatively arbitrary standardized tests? See, for far too long, we've made the goal of school all about what you know. But that's not the important question. The really important question is, what can you learn and do can you ask thoughtful questions, access relevant information, interpret it, analyze it, and then apply it? We shouldn't simply be measuring what students know and can recall in a test. We should be measuring whether or not they can craft really interesting questions, use process skills, 
and then create something useful with the information they discover. Now to do this, we have to recognize a critical and necessary shift in education. Much of modern schooling is still designed around relics of the factory model for school. The factory model, which might show up here in just a minute. <laughs> Let's see. There we go, the factory model for school. In this model, teachers serve as content experts who deliver content and distribute information to students in an effort to prepare them for predictable roles in a relatively slow-moving world. But we understand the modern world is dynamic. No longer do teachers rely, or do students rely on teachers to be their primary access point to information. Students now carry more information in their pocket than any one person could ever possibly know. Today, students need an adaptive model, one where teachers serve as learning experts who model what it looks like to use process skills as they empower students to thrive as learners and doers. Students need opportunities to engage in complex problem solving where they dream up creative solutions and then actually bring those solutions to life. Unfortunately, many classrooms still look exactly like mine did years ago. Mostly, if not entirely centered and focused on content, school systems and entire cottage industries work feverishly to prepare students to regurgitate information in what is a futile attempt to outpace computers at fact recall and calculations. Frankly, it often feels as if we've forgotten about the value of creativity and critical thinking systematically, almost entirely. And this observation isn't new, unfortunately. More than 16 years ago, the late Sir Ken Robinson gave arguably the most famous TED Talk of all time as he admonished schools to embrace creativity and to rethink the fundamental principles upon which we've built school. Around the same time, Tony Wagner was pushing for schools to adopt what he calls the seven survival skills for the 21st century. And I'm sorry y'all can't see all of this, but I'd like for you to notice how many of these skills you all wrote on the wall today. Competencies like critical thinking, adaptability, and communication. Skills that, for decades, we've known are really important, but that yet we've yet to effectively integrate into the learning experiences for students in our formal education institutions. The outlook can be quite bleak, but there's hope. School can be reimagined to have a profoundly different impact on all students. You remember earlier when Dr. Donan wouldn't let me open the printers until kids arrived? Well, a few days later, school actually started. Students showed up, we opened printers, we didn't break most of them, and we began learning and working together. During this time, I was privileged to meet a young student, we'll call her Emma. Emma was a 16-year-old high school junior, and she didn't identify as particularly tech-savvy tech or mechanically inclined, R remind you of anyone? <laughs> well, she, she had an experience in the fab lab in our school that shaped her future and drastically changed what I thought was possible in education. When presented with opportunities to provide ideas for a local company's uh, holiday window display, Emma jumped at the moment and immediately began imagining what it would look like to create an ice castle. But she returned to the school's fab lab and during the first six weeks it was open, began using online resources to learn enough of the design software to eventually create a rough tabletop model by laser cutting a few pieces of acrylic, fitting them together and making a really simple facade of a castle. She then joined with her teammates at the business partner's boardroom where each team would pitch their designs. You could feel their energy and excitement sort of brewing behind the nerves as her team began to their pitch. A few minutes into the pitch, one of the executives from the company interrupted, apologized and said, I'm sorry, but this is actually really cool. C can y'all build this like for real? And Emma didn't miss a beat. She eagerly responded, yes, despite possessing absolutely none of the technical skills to deliver on this promise. I looked at our principal and whispered, crap. I also have those technical skills to deliver. We ended up accepting the opportunity, and over the next five weeks, we returned to the lab, and Emma began collaborating with her teammates 
and with a few engineers from the company. She accessed online resources, and she learned enough AutoCAD to use the computer-controlled router in the school's lab. She started imagining and experimenting with how light would play with different textures and materials in the design. And she grew to lead her team to build this. Yeah, a 12 foot tall by 10 foot deep by 30 foot long acrylic ice castle. It was breathtaking. By blending the process skills that she'd been developing at her school with access to advanced technology in her school's lab, Emma had become empowered to take an idea from her head and transform that into a stunning, tangible solution. At the press event the company hosted to show off the displays, Emma, as you can imagine, became an instant hit. The media rushed to get photographs and do stand-up interviews as her friends and family just watched from the sidelines beaming with pride. It was truly a fantastic moment, but one that was perhaps a little bit fleeting. You see, the next week, Emma joined her classmates at the next business partner who pitched the next project. And this one, well, it was a little less artistic. Emma sat with her classmates as the business partners explained that as a local caving tour company, they'd be guiding the students through a project where they'd be challenged to create solutions to mitigate the spread of white nose syndrome, a highly contagious and deadly fungus that was beginning to afflict bat populations in the region. Well, despite the clear disconnect from the artistic elements of the Ice Castle project, Emma sat in the room and you could feel it. She was ready to go. As soon as we got back to the school, she bolted to the fab lab where she used the exact same skills she had used in the previous project. She began collaborating and engaged in leadership as she rallied her team to tackle this next challenge. She used uh, resources online to engage in, as, as she accessed and analyzed new information to better understand how bat populations behaved and how this fungus might spread because of those behaviors. She began using critical thinking and agility to craft really interesting questions and then imagine potential solutions. You see, while the media had celebrated the beauty and artistic value of the ice castle, and it was beautiful, classroom experiences that had celebrated process over product and skill development over memorization had equipped Emma with the self-confidence and the capacity to be able to create functional solutions to real problems, whether that meant designing a beautiful ice castle or slowing the spread of a gross bat fungus. Now, for the skeptics, perhaps the academics in the room, this focus on skill development doesn't have to come at the cost of content mastery. The two are not mutually exclusive. In fact, I'd argue they're quite complementary. Emma went on to earn a bachelor's degree and today is thriving in a full-time role with a national avionics company. And while that's great, perhaps more importantly, the experience she had at STEM school Chattanooga has grown from a pilot program at one extraordinary local public school into a national movement, a burgeoning national movement at least. First starting here in Hamilton County Schools, it grew into 30 more labs in public schools and today, more than 45,000 students in public schools spread across diverse communities throughout the United States are using school-based fab labs to cultivate those same process skills as they engage in authentic learning moments. I think it's clear we have to rethink the goal of modern education. We have to unseat content mastery as the singular ruler of the education universe. Our next generation is relying on us to equip them with opportunities to develop process skills so they can discover who they really are and make valuable contributions to society. Thank you.